Several months before uh, Brian Park came to the commission, um, I was aware that I was in a political condition in which it was very likely I was going to be not reappointed or be fired. And that it depended on the luck of the draw of what issues came forward. And when I looked at the potential calendar, I saw probably around two or three months ahead of time several issues that were likely to cause my demise. One of them was Bryant Park. Um, this is a very misunderstood issue. So I'm, I'm going to explain the politics behind it and why I un understood months ahead of time that it was very likely to cause uh, the mayor to not, not to reappoint me. But I had a professional political advisor who was advising me and, and he just said, do not ever let anyone know that I'm advising you because the Koch administration is at a disadvantage if they don't know you have a political advisor. And I said, what can I do when I, when, because we ruled on Brian Park and I got a phone call, there was an editorial and I got a phone call saying you won't be reappointed and I told my political advisor and he said, well, you actually can make a fight about this because this is the only time in the whole history of the city when a landmarks, the, 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 lack, the failure to appoint a landmarks commission could be a matter that would concern anyone outside a very small number of people because the parking violations bureau scandal is unfolding day after day after day and so this looks terrible. So, he said, go into the commission, um, state at a public hearing that you're being fired. And he said, the times will arrive now. And so I went to the commission and I said, um, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt the proceedings, but I'm being fired. And I just think <laughs> everyone should know that. And then two days later, David Dunlop called and this article appeared. And it was the beginning of the flow of articles concerning this matter, which largely were flowing because in contrast to the Viking Department Violations Bureau scandals, this seemed rather outrageous. And so the day after the article appeared, Anthony C. Wood called me and said, do you want to make a fight about this? And since he was the head of the Historic Districts Council and associated with every preservation group in the city, I knew he could uh, get some help. So I said yes. And now what I'm just going to go through now is some of the slides. And all they are is slides of the unfolding story as it appeared in the press, because in those days, that's how we communicated with one another through the, uh, uh, the press. And the Times was covering this. New York Newsday was covering this. Daily News, The Post, The uh, Observer, New York Newsday, the Staten Island Advance, and New York Magazine. In, in the summer, that summer, the Koch administration came to me and said, um, you can be reappointed, but you have to agree to something. We have a, a study being done of the landmarks law, and it's called the Cooper Committee, and you have to agree that as a commissioner, you will not make any public comment about the validity of the findings of the Cooper report. And I said, I can't do that blindly. What if they suggest something that's absolutely horrible? Um, I'm not a paid uh, commissioner, I'm serving as, a, as an unpaid commissioner, I'm still a member of civic society, so I said no. Then we uh, gave a negative report on the revised design for Bryant Park. Um, the Art Commission approved it. Um, the Parks Department did not require our approval to move forward. They only required that they bring the report before us. They did require the approval of the Art Commission, and once they had it, they could go forward. After which, the New York Times then suggested there should be some uh, explicit firings from the Commission, in particular, Anthony Tom. Dewey, my political consultant, <laughs> says, once they call out your name, they have to publish your response. And he said, let's take the words single-minded and zealotry and turn them. And so that's the title of the <laughs> It takes single-minded zeal to protect New York City's landmarks.
what I, I see as I look into the future of the city is that if we retain the landmarks law we have and we retain the advocacy, this city is going to become a place never before seen in human civilization. I see it 30 or 40 years out. Because what's going to happen is people will come here and say, rather than going to Delft, Bruges, <laughs> Turin, and five other places across the planet and getting concentrated doses of beauty but having to travel a lot in between, just go to New York and for the price of a subway token, not a token anymore, a subway ride, you can travel all around to five or six of those places in one afternoon. And I think that will be an extraordinary cityscape in the history of cities on this planet. And I perceive we're on the way to that. Even though we've had such terrible landmarks administration for 20 years, and the fact that we're still on the way to that is just the coup of your efforts. You're creating an extraordinary place on the planet.